Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Mira Al Junaid, a networking officer at MFNET, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second day of MFNET's regional COVID-19 operational research symposium. Yesterday was a highly exciting day where we were exposed to a wide range of interesting COVID-19 related research, research abstract presentations from different countries in the region. And today, hopefully, we will continue, continue our journey with a very rich program. And now allow me to introduce and hand uh, the floor over to Dr. Mohanad al -Nusur. Dr. Mohanad al is the Executive Director of MFNET. He is an internationally recognized expert in the field of epidemiology, research, and public health systems. Dr. al um, has a PhD from Glaxo University, Scotland, UK and holds a medical degree from Ukraine and a master's of science in epidemiology from the American University of Beirut. So um, Dr. Mohanad, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Miral. And uh, uh, again, you know, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are from different uh, regions. So we have to say all, you know, good morning and good day. Dear colleagues and uh, guests, you know, it's my pleasure to welcome you again, you know, to the second day of the infinite, infinite regional uh, COVID-19 operational research symposium. As we said yesterday, this symposium serves as an ideal space for uh, field epidemiology training program, FETB residents and graduates from uh, Eastern Mediterranean region, as well as public health professionals to share uh, their experience, research findings, and field investigation in COVID-19 with a wide present, uh, participation from the region. I hope that you use this time to engage in discussions that may lead to the elevation and adma advancement of COVID-19 research in uh, our uh, region and elsewhere. So just allow me to thank the Eastern Mediterranean region country who participate in this regional symposium, including uh, Afghanistan, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Morocco, Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Tunisia, uh, Yemen, Palestine, and uh, Bangladesh. I also want to sincerely thank our colleague, the Director for Information, Evidence and Research at the WHO EMRO, Dr. Arash Rashidian, for, be, for being with us today and for enriching our agenda further with keynote addresses that are sure to enhance our knowledge. And also allow me to thank our first uh, moderators for today's session. Colleague, uh, our colleague Konki, Dr. Konki from the Executive Director of Safety Net, and Dr. Carr, the uh, Director of TIFNET. Uh, we thank everyone presenting and we thank everyone joining today, us as well. Welcome once again and let our fruitful sci uh, scientific day start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohanad. And uh, now um, allow me to introduce Dr. Faris Lamy, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Dr. Faris Lamy is a public health expert who has been working in academia for 30 years. He is currently an associate professor at the Department of Community and Family Medicine at the College of Medicine, Baghdad University in Iraq. Dr. Faris, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maral. Thank you so much. Uh, dear colleagues, friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, uh, really, I wish to, uh, I'm honored really to, and uh, pleased to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker for today, uh, Professor Arash Rashidian. Uh, Dr. Arash is a very well-known uh, public health uh, person in the region. He is the Director of Information, Evidence and Research in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO. Uh, prior to joining WHO, Professor Rashidian worked as a professor of health policy and management at the School of Public Health and uh, Deputy Chancellor for Public Health and the Primary Care in Tehran University for Medical Sciences. Uh, professor Rashidian is a medical doctor with his degree from uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences and uh, holds a PhD degree 
uh, from the University of York, and he is also a research fellowship at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Professor Rashidian has experience in conducting consultancies throughout the world, uh, mainly in Europe, Central Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia. He published more than 100 uh, uh, papers in prestigious journals and participated in international conferences. Uh, before giving the floor to uh, Professor Rashidian, I just would like to attract the attention of the colleagues and the friends to use the Q&A uh, box below in order to put their questions, comments, and I would like to inform you that we have 10 minutes after uh, uh, Professor Rashidian's presentation to address the, any comment or question. Now I will give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Arash. You have 20 minutes for your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh Many thanks, Professor Lamid. Uh, this is really a pleasure to be with all of you. I just uh, started sharing. So can someone confirm that you can see my uh, slide? Yes, please. Yes. OK, many thanks. So before I start my presentation, so just I, I would like also to thank MPNET for this important uh, discussion and symposium that uh, has been organized especially uh, Dr. al Masur, I mean, to, to lead the program and also all the colleagues behind the program. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be with you. And obviously I'm also uh, thanking uh, Ms. Merar for her introduction of the program. Okay, so what I'm going to talk is actually, and I try to bring different elements uh, that are relevant to the, the research aspects of COVID in our region. I won't cover everything, but try to go through many issues. And, in fact, so I will refer to just very quickly saying that why it mattered more than usual. So we are advocates of use of science and research in decision-making, evidence-informed policy-making, but here, why did it matter more? And then so looking at the issues research related to clinical management, to vaccines and prevention, to uh, disease trajectory and epidemiology, and also the impact, and then going also to some challenges related to infodemic, but I look at those challenges from the point of that sometimes science itself becomes a source of infodemic. So that's uh, from that point of view. So I'm uh, bringing the picture of the region within my discussion. My apologies that I will be going relatively quickly to the discussion, but hopefully uh, in the session afterward, if there are those questions, I will be very happy to respond to. Obviously, I mean, for COVID, it was much, we always say research is not a luxury for public health. And we believe in that. But here it was very much more important. We, we dealt with the disease, which was high impact. By high impact, I mean causing deaths and causing disruption in the whole of society, for which we had many, many unknowns, starting from origin of the disease, still not resolved, issues of the diagnosis and clinical management. I mean, diagnosis, a lot of progress made, but it's still costly. Clinical management, still we don't have a specific medicines that are directly for the disease, although we know how to manage it better. The trajectory of the disease, I mean, it keeps surprising us. Look at what's happening in recent, the last few weeks in several countries of the region. And then the issues of also the, the how it's transmitted, interaction with other factors, social, the role of vaccines, vaccines themselves, a lot of questions. So we, we rarely, I mean, it has not been the case for many, many years that we had so many questions about one, disease that was uh, so high impact for the society. Okay, so I start from different aspects. So I will look at, first of all, there, is, there are plenty of research on COVID, many publications. Just, I mean, I check again, the number of publications and every time I talk uh, about this topic, I look at how many papers coming out on COVID, just by looking at the PubMed, which doesn't cover everything. So over 85,000 publications, since last June, 75,000 publications on COVID. So there is plenty, many of them are useful. But then within our region is also, I mean, there are a lot of research happening there. So I mean, one country of the region, Iran, that you can publicly check the ethical clearance of research studies. So it's easy to search from outside to see what's happening, publicly available data. They have over 800 research studies that have been cleared ethically for uh, COVID-related topics. So I would assume in many other countries there is I mean, similar numbers. And then, I mean, the case of China, I put in the end 600 randomized, minimum 600 randomized control trials. Why, why does it matter? China is a large country. But remember, China had the disease for a very short period of time, I mean, the number of cases. And then so many 
uh, sort of, I mean, uh, randomized controlled trials. But then many of these trials are focused on treatment. And this picture is focused on what mainly what has happened in EMR countries. So the majority of randomized controlled trials are coming from uh, Iran, Egypt, Pakistan, and then the, a few other countries. So the, this data is a bit, I mean, sort of old. We haven't updated it in the last four months, but I mean, more or less gives the picture. So I have two important messages here. First of all, many of these randomized controlled trials being conducted in countries of the region are really a small size. 70% 70, uh, 70 seven out of 10 of these randomized controlled trials, they have a target sample size of below 100. And we know with the sample size of even below 1,000, it's extremely unlikely that you find anything useful that you can use it for management of disease. So many of these research studies actually, they don't get you anywhere. 17%, one, almost one out of five of these randomized controlled trials are uh, based on traditional medicine and herbal medicine. And over a year now, there, is, there isn't even one single strong theory that suggests any of these can be effective for treatment of the disease. So there is a lot happening, but if all of that is helpful, that's a question. And you can see that uh, sort of the infographic to, uh, on the right side of my presentation. So the figures representing how which medicines to, uh, attracted more studies. And you, we, right now we know that most of these medicines that are part of this trial, they were actually ended up not being very useful. Some of them even harmful for, for the case. But then on the other hand, if you want to assess treatment of cell, you really need large scale, multi-center, multi-country randomized controlled trials. A major example of it was the, what we call WHO Solidarity Randomized Control Trial for COVID-19 treatment. It focused on four medicines. There were attempts to expand it beyond the four medicines, but I mean, that hasn't happened yet. So four medicines, I mean, some people say that, oh, the, the trial didn't find anything, but actually the trial was found a very important uh, message, which four of the treatment options that were being recommended as treatment for the disease. They were shown that they do not help patients. They do not help. I mean, remdesivir, interferon beta, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and then combination of lopinavir, ritonavir. And some of these medicines are really expensive as well. So, and then I'm really glad to say that uh, several countries of the region, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Lebanon were very actively involved in this uh, solidarity randomized control trial, global trial. Another example, so a famous example, the recovery trial, uh, uh, sort of led by the researchers from the UK. Again, large scale, multi thousand patient study. I mean, they, 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 this is a trial that identified dexamethasone as the lifesaver for patients that are dealing with respiratory complications. So a large trial could help that. If they had done it again, a small sample size, even with selecting the right medicine to try, they would not have been able to show that. And they also identified azithromycin, no benefit, convalescent plasma, no benefit, and similarly, hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, uh, ritonavir combination. And uh, the, the, there is another uh, finding of the this trial that dotocilizumab is probably a sort of a useful medicine for reducing deaths among uh, COVID patients. So, I mean, uh, again, a, re, a reuse of a medicine that already existed for other purposes. Looking at research for vaccines, there is plenty happening. So I mean, as part of my job in the WHO uh, that we, we cover these uh, developments, especially related to vaccines and treatment on a weekly basis and discuss it in policies of the region on weekly meetings. So there are many more coming. So right now there are at least 85 vaccines globally that are in clinical phases. 28 of them have reached phase three trials. So I mean, the trial that can be used for the basis of recommending a vaccine use. Again, I mean, really good that seven countries in the region have been involved in such trials. This is probably the first time in our region that our countries have been part of the development of vaccines that uh, are sort of being introduced also for treatment of important diseases. So you can see for Sinopharm vaccines, I mean, six countries of the region for CanSino1, for Gamalia vaccine from Russia, uh, UAE, and then for Cuban vaccine, Iran is involved in the, the phase three trial of a, a new vaccine. There are also two vaccines that uh, are being developed inside Iran that have reached clinical phases, and one vaccine in Egypt is expected to reach clinical phase very soon. So important research happening, and some of these have resulted in uh, uh, sort of some progress. 
So this, this, this table and the following table summarizes what we know about vaccines at the moment. So these are, this table focuses on vaccines that are part of the COVAX agreement, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, an agreement between Gavi, WHO, and CEPI to uh, ease access to uh, vaccines globally. And sort of, you can see, I mean, sort of the effects have been, the, the estimated efficacy based on the uh, phase three trials is recorded here. The ones that are involved are the ones that actually they have published their results in peer reviewed journals. There are some that are not involved yet, so there is no paper yet out. And this is interesting for this is, this is the first time that, for example, you, you know that Johnson & Johnson, even without a pu publishing a paper yet, they've been approved in a few countries for use. And so, so in a way, these vaccines are coming out to the market much sooner than was the case before because of this. And then now we have some effectiveness studies from at least two of the vaccines that they are showing that the results in trial were actually correct. And these are making saving lives. But there are many more vaccines that are not part of COVAX and many of them, several of them are actually being used in countries of the region. Among these, the only one that has a published peer reviewed paper is the sort of Russian vaccine, the Sputnik 5 vaccine by Gamalia Institute. But then there are more happening. And then uh, so some trials, as I mentioned, are happening in our region as well. Many of these phase three trials are actually not yet finished. So although there are papers out of, out of some of them, then they, they are still continuing to ensure the results are uh, uh, confirmed in the end. There are a group of studies that WHO supports. We call them unity studies. I mean, sort of because it's, the intention is that more countries work together. They have results for themselves, but they also help other countries to understand better the situation. They focus on different issues. I mean, issues of transmission, clinical features. I mean, recently protocols for vaccine effectiveness. Phase four studies was added, and so these are the studies that WHO also support in the region. And this slide summarizes some a group of such studies. So we call them zero survey studies. So these are population-based zero survey assessment. And the, the studies listed here are all supported by the WHO. And you can see, for example, in Afghanistan, one round finished, the other round is ongoing, more than three rounds, Pakistan two rounds, et cetera, et cetera. And so they are showing different results. And this, I mean, there are some variants because of time and also the methodology of the uh, sort of a study, but then they help policymakers to understand the situation better in the country. The other issue of interest, again, focus of research is issue of what we call the variant of concern. I mean, we know that there are mutations in the virus and there are new virus, uh, uh, I mean, sort of behaviors of the virus happening here and there. And within those, I mean, sort of some of these mutations, many mutations happen in any virus. I mean, in this one in particular, I mean, it's not that fast mutating, but because it's um, affecting millions of people and it's lasting for a long period, we see more uh, mutations out of it. Three of them have become, I mean, sort of major issues and there could be more coming in future. But then there are some definition, this is a working definition of WHO for what becomes a variant of concern. But then research on that. So these variant of concern become important because one of, if you so, look at the, the definition, so if they increase transmissibility, if they make the disease more virulent, affecting more people more strongly or maybe causing in death more, but also if they affect the, on the response of the, the disease to vaccines or treatment, that's also important. And for example, the impact of, I mean, two of the variants, uh, variants on some vaccines has been notable. Also, fortunately so far, we can say more or less all vaccines are working against all the variants, but, all, but the, the, the amount of, I mean, effectiveness of or efficacy of the vaccines against the variant has changed. And these, uh, these tables uh, summarizes what is known about two of these variants uh, related to different vaccines that are in the market. And obviously you can see we need much more data and we need much more assessment of such situations. Again, now I go to the impact. So what is the impact on mortality? Obviously we know it causes a lot of this, so I'm not going to discuss that. But then different studies, a Europe-wide study, a study in South, South Africa and a study in Qatar in our region, they all showed that, I mean, they the cause more deaths in men than women. So I mean, sort of, there is a sort of, we, we know about the age difference, impact of age on the mortality. So if you are older, the effects are, I mean, uh, on average higher, but then also gender, uh, the, the, the things that men are more predisposed 
to the severe outcomes of the disease. Obviously, I mean, uh, the uh, distribution among genders is, is not different. So, but then, I mean, also there are assessment of impact of on mortality in Oman, for example, at least 15% in all cause mortality in Oman happened, uh, uh, increase happened uh, due to COVID. And uh, for, the, for a period of time, the study period that covered, I mean, sort of a uh, few months, about uh, two out of three deaths were caused during the period by the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Similar study in Iran suggesting that, I mean, there is a considerable amount of deaths happening due to the COVID uh, um, uh, pandemic. So I talk about the impact on deaths, but then if you want to measure what is your most important source of data, the most important source of data is actually death registration. But the situation, unfortunately, in origin is not good. The, in EMR, almost, I mean, half of the deaths are properly, or no, not fully properly, I would say timely registered and are recorded in the system. And you can see this is the variant of sort of reporting in different countries. We have countries that almost uh, no deaths is registered in a systematic way to countries that are close to 100. So when the quality of registration of deaths is also not good, then measuring the impact of uh, sort of disease on, on death, it becomes more difficult. So such data can be used to assess what you call excess mortality, so increased mortality. As you can see, there are different estimates. So we have some uh, analysis from Iraq, so it could be up to the increasing, I mean, 30% in 35% in uh, mortality, the normal mortality, 35% additional mortality compared to the baseline as uh, based on the disease, but I mean, that could be lower. So minimum, I mean, I would say that's the minimum expected uh, increase is 15% increase, which is a massive amount of uh, extra deaths when we talk of, I mean, a disease that affects the whole society. This is a further analysis for Oman. So if you look at the graph left-hand side, so the uh, green line shows uh, COVID-related deaths. The brown line showing the average the deaths, I mean, uh, in the country in 2018 and 19, so that's before COVID. And the blue line uh, is talking about uh, the time during the COVID. As you can see, the first few months, because Oman, I mean, the trajectory of disease that started a bit later than some other countries. So early on, the 2020 is similar to the previous two years, but then it, it become a difference. So this difference most likely is happening because of the disease. But then bear in mind that this may not show the real impact. On the other hand, for example, we expect that the deaths due to road traffic accidents in the region might have reduced because people are traveling less, the roads are less busy, there have been lockdowns here and there. So if that's the case, then the real impact might become bigger. The impact is also always not directly related to the diagnosis of the disease. Because for example, if patient with cancer cannot reach the service they need because of the disease, then there might be more deaths in need for other causes that are actually caused by the pandemic itself. So it's a difficult picture to, to measure and assess. So I move to the next topic is the issue of infodemic. So there is a, a key paper by WHO and external partner on a, uh, developing a framework for uh, measuring and responding to infodemic. So that's for your reference. But then I, what I would like to focus on is that sort of, we look at always saying that, okay, to, to avoid infodemic and to, to be able to make the right decision, use science and science can be your solution. I fully agree with that. But good science has that potential. If the science is not done in a proper way, that is, becomes uh, the challenge. So we, we talk about, I mean, early on with some example about problems of low quality research. But then there are many examples that the research finding has been badly interpreted or has been taken out of context and been used by policymakers, some senior clinicians, some senior scientists. It's not just about the public or the journalists who are not aware of these uh, sort of research methodologies. It actually happens by all. And actually, we, in fact, we have several, many journalists that they are responding to infodemic by correcting the mistakes that are being there. And there are also abuse of science and research processes, for example, if a company has a product, they sort of misinterpret the results of a study and show it in a different way just to have their product to be uh, sold better. So the roles of ethics committees and governance of research becomes more important. So, so what is called science might actually be part of the problem as well if it's not done properly. 
So it's really important this uh, sort of being sure that there are so many studies happening, but these studies are well governed. They are based on priority. They are of adequate size, adequate quality, and they are being conducted and analyzed and reported properly. These are really, really essential. These were essential several months ago. They are still essential and they will remain. A few months ago, I had a presentation on a sort of global, I mean, uh, conference on infodemic. And then colleagues there, they actually quoted one of my sentences. I really loved it. So I put it here. A, a major issue is that sort of critical thinking, critical appraisal. So it's not whatever called science doesn't mean it's reliable. We need to look at it that way, uh, with critical eyes to ensure that it's responding to our needs. It's also, it's usually not about one small study here or one study there. I mentioned it's, it should be based on large scale studies that are extremely good quality or a body of knowledge that is coming from different sources coming together and then we make the decisions that are, we can rely upon. Next step, I mean, sort of, I just list here, I mean, sort of a summary of what we do in WHO to support COVID related research. So, I mean, the, I put it in one line, so WHO small grants. Uh, I'm really glad that we've actually doubled our sort of support for a small research grant uh, in this biennium compared to the last two years. This is be because of COVID. The flagship public health journal of the region, it's the Mediterranean Health Journal, I mean, gives priority to COVID related studies and regularly publishes on that. I mentioned several epidemiology studies. There are also case control studies in healthcare workers, et cetera. There are studies related to clinical management and processes, the studies related to social interventions. And then we are hoping that vaccine effectiveness studies will roll out in the region. We haven't got any country yet involved in the, the latter group of studies yet. I hope there will be uh, countries who show, they've shown interest. We are actually discussing with uh, three, four countries at the moment. This is really important to, to be used in our region. And I conclude here. Research on COVID is and remains a necessity. It's not a luxury, as I mentioned. It's really important. It has helped our understanding. It has also a, a, a role to play and respond to our questions. So there are also research studies that are not of good quality. It's important to govern those. The challenge of pseudoscience and infodemic is real. Collaboration, multi-country uh, research studies, the, the things that come together, knowledge together is really important. And absolutely, we need many more studies on the impact of social interventions and preventive measures. So as examples, I mean, travel restrictions happen again and again in response to COVID. They probably help, but how much? And what sort of travel restriction and when? We do not have good studies that answer these questions. The issues of the trade off if we know lockdown helps in controlling the, the challenge, but then there are so many different ways of doing lockdown. Lockdown in country A is very different from country B. And what they've done today is very different from what they did three months ago. So how to make sure that I mean sort of we know which, which approaches are more effective, more cost effective. And then obviously systematic guidance and oversight of research is required. And this is my last slide. I hand over to uh, Dr. Piras for his uh, chairmanship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Arash, for this very useful, very fruitful, very uh, insightful, really. And uh, presentation really great. Um, in fact, we have some time for uh, some questions and the uh, comments that have been raised by the by the colleagues. And uh, probably the first one I would like to address is uh, why why most of the randomized control trials done in the region are of a small size and uh, not up to the standard. Unfortunately, what is your uh, explanation behind that? Yeah, I mean, so. Could be different reasons, so we haven't done a sort of systematic analysis of this. So we use our shared, I mean, understanding of the concept. First of all, I mean, if you are a small research team in one hospital, that's the only thing you can do. If there is a no, no system of collaborating with others, and then sort of, that's the way you go. Sometimes you are also too much rushed to get to the results. So you want to do something quickly so that you are the first, but you end up with such, such a study that doesn't help anyone. So that could be also the reason. The other issue could be that funding. So, I mean, if I'm a professor in a uh, clinical setting and I would, would like to host a large randomized control trial, I really need good amount of money to be able to do that. And that level of funding may not be available in all contexts. But then my response to this one is that we see that countries are doing randomized control trials. So that means they are spending money. The problem is they are not linking them together. 
So it, so many, for example, at the time, so many research studies on hydroxychloroquine started in, many, in several countries of the region have done small trials on that issue. Even in a given country, there could be 20 of those. If those 20, the money was put together, a reasonable trial could have been done in that. So I think most of it is about collaboration, sort of research governance issues, and then probably our ethics committees should be more stringent. Sometimes they should say no to a small study just because it's a small, saying that you are not going to help science if you just do a small study. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, what the solidarity uh, uh, trial can give us uh, some sort of um, thinking of making such a collaboration in the, can in the region uh, if we want to conduct um, such a high, a high level and a high quality uh, control trial. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, solidarity trial, as I mentioned, I mean, sort of it, uh, the impact, I mean, the use of all, what would say, it was open to all countries of the region. I was part of the team that were coordinating the study in the region, but I mean, it was uh, my colleagues who were actually dealing with different aspects of it. So what we noted that the countries that had actually a stronger capacity on conductor randomized control trials, they, it was easier for them to join. So it's really important. One of the things that this uh, pandemic has shown, if you have rapid questions, you, you are able to answer that question rapidly if you have this uh, infrastructure from before. You cannot build it just right away. But then on the other hand, what it also showed is that, I mean, high impact, interactive, multi-country research is totally possible. And uh, uh, Professor Firas, I would add to say that, for example, the studies that are happening on trials of vaccines, I mean, this is unprecedented. This didn't exist in our region before. Yeah. Yeah. So, and these capacities will actually help us also for future issues. We also hope that, for example, this research study is not only adding the capacity of research for other aspects, but they will also help us to add the capacity for, for example, development of vaccines, for production of them, on, on different aspects of it. But yeah, I mean, solidarity trial was, was a really important study. And if your colleagues remember now, I mean, everything goes so fast. Some, some of the medicines that that trial identified as non-effective. The trial was actually the first to show these things are not effective. And being able to say that this medicine is not effective is not a simple message. It's actually important because you, you prevent the wastage of resources, you prevent the wrong medicine is given, but also every medicine has some side effects. Well, if there is no benefit, you are actually giving side effects to the patients only. So then the, the, all these together, this is a really important thing to do. Yeah, uh, very quick questions from the colleagues about the approval for Sinopharm. Do you have any idea whether uh, Sinopharm is going to be approved in the coming so weeks? Sinopharm, as we, uh, so I mean, this is not my area of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I know. So yeah. my colleagues uh, deal with that, but I, I'm, I'm aware that uh, Sinopharm has submitted their files to the WHO for review. So they are under review. We expect that within a few weeks, uh, WHO okay. would uh, announce the position. At the same time, we are aware that a few countries of the region actually are, have approved the uh, use of Sinopharm in the country and they are using it. And, I, and so far, we have not received uh, any uh, sort of uh, reports of serious uh, adverse events or anything similar to that. So, I mean, let's wait for WHO uh, review on that. But at the same time, it seems that the countries are using it and it seems to be reasonable to do, to do so. Yeah, another colleague uh, asked about the ivermectin. Is there any evidence of its effect in, in, in COVID? I think this had been closed, right? Yeah, ivermectin was one of those medicines that came out as a sort of promising based on a couple of small trials. But then several trials since then have been published, all of them shown that it's not effective. So again, ivermectin is one of those medicines that is not recommended. And position of WHO is that do not use it for clinical management only if you have a large scale trial. trial that you can assess it further. Because I mean, we don't have yet a major trial on it. So that might be helpful, but the, definitely this is not part of treatment and combination of existing trials globally, they show no effect from ivermectin, no benefit. Okay, one last point regarding the, uh, you mentioned something about the extra deaths that had been reported by some countries in the region and uh, uh, I think you know, considering this collateral damage during the pandemic is quite important. And um, I'm just thinking of, um, uh, is there any, any uh, uh, consistent and standardized uh, way in order to make the countries in the region follow to, to identify exactly what amount of these extra, extra debt? 
X, uh, oh, the excess deaths, okay. Yeah, I mean, sort of, so we, we are both from the region and we know how these systems and most of the colleagues who are with us, how these systems work. I mean, many of us here are clinicians or researchers. I mean, unfortunately, research on cause of death is not very common. It's not a fancy topic. Not many people know how to do it. And that results the system is not improving. But many clinicians here, they can ask themselves, when they certify a death, how accurate they are when they do that, how carefully they write it down. We know many clinicians, they actually give it to the most junior person of the team to just fill the form. And then the coder should decide whether what does it the meaning. That's the situation. A lot of this in our region is not properly recorded. But then when it comes to the issue of the COVID related issues, so I mean, the, ideally you have a good system that records causes of the death and then you use that for valid analysis. What you are doing now, I mean, we are not relying on that that much. What we are really looking at, we are looking at the trends of deaths from before and try to sort of assess on that. This is a solution that helps for the countries to understand. And as time goes by, we will have a much better and much clearer picture. To be honest, the issue is that, I mean, we realize even high income countries with good system, at the start, they had problems in identifying COVID related deaths. So we heard those issues, not only from our region, but for example, in the US or in the UK, if you remember early months. It, so the, it's, it's not an easy thing anyhow. So the, what we right now, we know, I mean, the extra deaths, there is no shame to admit it. You, we need to measure it. We need to report it properly. And that, that helps us. That could, guides the policymaker to make action, especially as this uh, respond, uh, responding to COVID is not just within the Ministry of Health's hand. If other politicians do not go into it, all, all of them are needed together, and they will react better if they know the figures more accurately and more completely. Thank you. Thank you so much. In fact, we have other uh, questions, but unfortunately, we uh, exceed the uh, located time. Uh, thank you so much. To, uh, Professor Arash for um, being with us and presenting this great uh, presentation and uh, hopefully all other questions can be addressed later on in when we send the final report to the, all the attendees. Thank you so much again. Back yeah, many thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Faris and Dr. Arash and everyone who participated in this um, very fruitful discussion. Uh, now we move to the symposium's uh, third session titled Methodology, Modeling, and the Study of Comorbidities. Uh, our moderator for this session is Dr. Maria Concertia Lemkison. Dr. Maria is the Executive Director of the South Asia Field Epidemiology and Technology Network. Um, welcome, Dr. Maria. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mira. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's an honor and pleasure for me to be able to participate in this uh, session. So before we begin the session proper, may I have a few reminders, no? Number one, may I rem remind the presenters that you will have 10 minutes to present, which includes already the question and answer. You please have to share your screen from your own laptops, but if you're going to have a uh, problems, please immediately tell us so that uh, the IT person of the host will be able to help you and, and, and uh, uh, present uh, the, your, your PowerPoint for you. Okay. Um, please try your best to stay within your 10 minutes. If you go over, I'm sorry, but I have to stop you. Uh, I will give you a signal at nine minutes. So you will know that you have one minute to go. During the question and answer portion, please listen carefully to the question. If you do not understand it, it's okay. There will be uh, others in the audience uh, who will be able to help you or interpret the question for you if you do not um, understand the English uh, version. Okay, and then um, we see to it that you are on camera the whole time, even if you've presented your, uh, if you're finished your presentation, you have to wait until the end of the session. Uh, please keep your mic muted. Uh, and then, uh, so that we can start promptly on time. Okay, so uh, again, I will need to remind you to please uh, keep on time. So, uh, 
For the audience, you please write your questions in the Q&A box and not on the chat box. Okay. So with that, let me start with the first presenter. And it is an honor to introduce to you Dr. Shireen Al-Ghazali, an FETP graduate from Egypt, who will present to you this afternoon the impact of comorbidities on COVID-19 severity and mortality in Egypt. Dr. El Ghazali, the floor is yours. Dr. Shireen, you can now start to share your screen. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I think there is some problem. Okay, shall I ask the IT from the from our host to uh, uh, put up the screen of Dr. Shireen instead? Put up the presentation. Oh, there you are. We see it. No, we don't. Sorry. Yes. May I ask Iman to instruct here to share the hair screen? There you are. Go ahead, please. Yes. Please start. Yes. Uh, I think it may be uh, it changes the mood of the presentation. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I am Shirin Radali, epidemiologist at the Epidemiology and Surveillance Department in Egypt. Uh, my study is about the impact of comorbidities on COVID-19 severity and mortality in Egypt. Next. A clinical presentation of COVID-19 infection uh, range from asymptomatic to very severe pneumonia with acute respiratory disease, septic shock, and multi organ failure, which may lead to this. Uh, all the population and people with underlying medical condition are at high risk of severe disease and this if they infect with COVID-19. Uh, identifying risk groups and risk factors for COVID-19 severity and mortality is important for guiding efficient and appropriate prevention and management. Okay. Uh, our objective to describe the demographic and epidemiologic characteristic of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Egypt and to determine the impact of different comorbidities uh, on COVID-19 patient outcome, including admission to ICU, need for invasive ventilation and the mm -hmm. uh, Data of all the COVID-19 patients was obtained retrospectively from the National Egyptian Disease Surveillance System needs. Data collected by interviewing patients with standardized form victim left demographic, medical history, clinical literature, disease course, and outcome. Our study subject were patients confirmed for COVID-19 uh, by BCR, which admitted to infectious disease chest or general governmental hospital during February to May uh, 2020 with completed data. Okay. Uh, our definition for the study variable comorbidities, diagnostic clinical or uh, laboratory. Uh, include diabetes, uh, COVD, cardiovascular, renal, hepatic disease, immunocompromised, and obesity. Severe obesity, body mass index defined as the greater than 40 kilograms per meter square. Immunocompromised included the immune deficiency, prolonged use of immune suppression, uh, disease severity defined as ICU admission, uh, and the need for invisible ventilation index. Okay. Uh, 
our data analysis method for descriptive and analytic. For descriptive, the frequencies and percentage used for categorical variable, median and interquartile range used for continuous variables. Uh, by variable uh, was used to evaluate association between demographic number and the type of comorbidities and disease severity. A multivariate analysis used to examine the association between number and the type of comorbidities and the disease coverage adjusted for age and gender. Mm -hmm. uh, the only number of suspected cases is about uh, 65,000 and a half, uh, with the 43% of confirmed cases and 76% with completed data and 21% with comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Uh, the median age was uh, 44 uh, years old, and uh, the majority of cases were the age group from 35 to uh, 65 age group, uh, with the 55% uh, were okay. uh, regarding, regarding the clinical picture and outcome of COVID-19 patients, uh, fever represents 80% and the cough represents 70%. Percent. And for severity, ICU admission was uh, 3 percent, uh, needed ventilator was 2 percent, and the test was 5 percent. Uh, the di diabetes was, was uh, the most prevalent the comorbidities, the blood was 12 percent, and the cardiovascular 5 percent, and the chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary was 4 percent. Uh, the high mortality rate and the high uh, percentage of ICU admission and the percentage of needed ventilation was observed in the age group uh, above uh, 65. Uh, regarding uh, the outcome, uh, we recognize that uh, the high mortality rate uh, was shown in uh, the, the renal disease uh, and the high percentage of the ICU admission uh, was observed in the obesity and also the high percentage of uh, needed ventilation was observed in the obesity. Uh, this graph shows the outcome of the COVID-19 patient with comorbidities by age and gender in Egypt. Uh, the second. Uh, after adjusting for age and gender, uh, those who are suffering from uh, one comorbidity uh, were, were more likely to this and ICU admission and the required ventilation than those uh, who didn't have uh, any comorbidities. Uh, furthermore, the who suffer from one of comorbidities are more likely to this and ICU admission and the required ventilator than those who have uh, one comorbidity. The next one. Uh, when the individual comorbidities uh, were included in the multivariate analysis to replace the comorbidity variable, all comorbidities are associated with increased risk of uh, this, except for the bad disease, and also all the comorbidities associated with ICU admission, except for the bad and immunocompromised. And the all comorbidities associated with the required ventilator, except also for the patient and immunocompromise. Mm -hmm. uh, we conclude that patient six age and comorbidity may act as trigger triggers for increased risk of severity and mortality caused by COVID-19. Higher mortality rates are found in men, however. No significant difference found between males and females in severity. Uh, COVID-19 patients in more than 65 years old are more liable to be outcome. Patients with comorbidities are a high risk of deteriorating the outcome and this especially with multiple comorbidities. Males and females with underlying comorbidity are equally having high risk of COVID-19 
preventing infection and severe outcome. And the diabetes is the most prevalent comorbidity among the COVID-19 patients in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So our recommendation enhances the community screening program for non-communicable disease in Egypt for disease detection, establish the prevention and the control program for non-communicable disease, especially diabetes, take all necessary precautions, including the vaccination program for patients with comorbidities, especially elderly for COVID-19 prevention, and support COVID-19 patients with comorbidities, especially elderly, and the female for preventive disease deterioration and fatality. Okay. Finally, I would like to thank preventive sector, Ministry of Health and Population, and the Surveillance and Epidemiology Department, and the Egyptian FETV, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping on time. And we, uh, we actually have uh, uh, time for questions. And um, uh, let me read one from uh, Jeffrey Njiti. Uh, he asked if there was any patient who didn't need ventilation and didn't die. I think this is a very hard, I, I think this is very hard to interpret. Uh, let me go to, the second one from Islam Said. Why are males at more risk for dying? Do you have any yes. inherent factor for them? Thank you. Yes, uh, I think um, it's uh, predominant in, in, uh, in our study and also uh, it is compatible with our, uh, other studies. Uh, I, may, I think it may be attributed to uh, to change in uh, uh, genetic, I think it uh, suggests genetic predisposition as a cause of uh, this finding. Uh, hello? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, thank yeah. you. I actually have, uh, we have time for one more. Uh, uh, question. You know, the leading causes of comorbidity in your study were uh, diabetes, uh, uh, cardiovascular yes. diseases, and COPD. Yes. Are these three also the leading causes of death yes. or leading causes of sickness without yes. COVID? Yes. You know, your usual... Uh, leading causes of morbidity and mortality in your country without COVID. Are these the three leading causes as well? Uh, yes, and I think this is uh, very important that we know that uh, the diabetes is uh, the most prevalent. Uh, it uh, might be explained by also immunosuppressive effects uh, of uh, high blood glycemia. Uh, so diabetes are more uh, vulnerable uh, or liable to the need of family infection. Okay, so thank you so much for your very interesting study, Dr. Sherin. Uh, we thank now you. go to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next is uh, supposed to be uh, presented by Dr. Nayeri Esmal Zadeh from Iran but will in fact be presented to us by Dr. Mirwais Amiri of MFINET. The abstract or the paper is entitled, A Comparison of Different Approaches to Estimate Initial Reproduction Number of SARS-CoV-2 in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Dr. Amiri, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I, I tried to actually uh, start sharing my screen, uh, but I think it's already shared. Yeah, you can see that, yeah? I think it's- Yes. Mm. Okay, I'm uh, uh, Mirwais Amiri, uh, uh, the research and policy uh, uh, team leader for GHD Infinite, and I'm also the resource uh, uh, the 
backup resource for this session since uh, uh, Naire Ismailzada is not uh, here. I'll be presenting on her behalf. Um, uh, in this session, we will look at the comparison of different uh, methods um, to estimate the initial uh, the initial reproduction number of uh, COVID-19 in Islamic Republic of Iran. And uh, the reproductive number uh, is the, uh, basically, in, in simple terms, the uh, uh, number that uh, is affected on average by, by one case of, it's also called all or, or not. Uh, so the reproduction number is uh, that uh, average number of people infected by, by just one case. Can you uh, proceed to the next slide, please? So uh, here, the basic reproduction number, or R0 or R0 is an, uh, as we looked at the, uh, the simple definition is an epidemic uh, threshold. Actually, uh, it's a, a very important parameter. It actually, it indicates the uh, transmission of the, on, of the disease. Uh, which, uh, which uh, basically uh, should prompt initiation of, uh, of planning and implementation of response to that. And uh, it's uh, calculated in mathematical terms. Uh, it uh, represents the average number of secondary patients uh, in a fully susceptible community uh, at the beginning of the, of the disease or, or out, an outbreak. And um, uh, when uh, we look at the uh, flattening, we remember flattening the curve. When we look at the, how the, the curve goes up, uh, this is the ascending part of the curve. Uh, it's called, uh, uh, in this case, reproductive uh, reproduction number or, or not is uh, more than, than one. But uh, if it, it just goes to plateau or it goes down, then it's, uh, we assume that the, now the reproduction number, uh, the reproduction number is uh, going down or it's less than uh, less than one. Can you proceed to the next slide, please? So for this, this is just this was just in a background on on uh, what needed to be measured in different methods. Uh, we are dealing with this number, the reproduction number. So um, uh, we consider uh, five common uh, approaches or methods which were used uh, for the calculation of uh, reproduction number uh, uh, or or not select the best approach for, for its calculation. And uh, this uh, study was just looking at uh, uh, using these different methods uh, through uh, an R uh, software uh, package. It's a very robust uh, statistical software package. Uh, 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 R is a very robust language uh, platform which uh, use different packages. And one is called R0, uh, R0 which is for the uh, calculation of this. So this was used and uh, there were a number of uh, uh, methods or uh, uh, approaches. One uh, used, uh, it's called the exponential growth or EG as, as we call it, the maximum likelihood or uh, ML. And then uh, time dependent reproduction number, it was another packet uh, or another method of, by which, or another model that was used. Uh, we call it here TD. Uh, and the attack rate or AR. And uh, finally, the sequential Bayesian uh, uh, model or SB. All, all these five uh, different methods were used. Can you proceed to the next slide? So uh, as a background, the first epidemic of, uh, the first wave of the epidemic was uh, in late February in Iran and all the way to the 30th of March, uh, just uh, between these few days, the first wave of the, uh, the epidemic was uh, uh, basically started. And uh, uh, for this method, uh, uh, the, seria, the serial interval, uh, 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 just the gamma distribution, it's one kind of distribution uh, that is looked uh, uh, at uh, using this uh, statistical software uh, package. So for the serial uh, 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 interval distribution, gamma distribution was used, and then <clears throat> 10,000 simulations for each of the, uh, these methods, for each of these five methods were used uh, using the uh, R software package. And then they were compared. They were compared for validity and their best value, uh, the least uh, um, 
uh, amount of uh, unreliability and all those other parameters. And the evaluation of uh, all these uh, uh, parameters uh, use the lowest uh, 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 root mean square error or RMSE as, as shown here. Can you go to the next slide? So uh, the results basically showed that uh, the, the um, can you see the slide? Okay, the results show that, yeah, just go to the uh, earlier slide, please. Previous slide, please. Hello, yeah, Pre previous slide. So uh, you look at the, uh, yeah, this one. The exponential growth uh, method, uh, uh, you actually basically see for all of these five methods, the exponential growth, the uh, maximum likelihood, the time dependent or TD method, the uh, sequential biential uh, uh, method, and the, uh, uh, the last one, the uh, attack rate method. Uh, for all of these methods, some of the reproduction numbers in, in front of each of these, you, you see 1.5 or something around that, uh, those numbers with uh, confidence, uh, some confidence intervals. So uh, you just see the results here. Uh, uh, the, the whole package was run through the uh, software, and then these were the results that were obtained. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So here, if you look at the, the uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to share my own screen, but I cannot, but, uh, I cannot now show my, my, um, uh, my pointer here on the screen. Uh, if you look at the middle column, the time dependent, uh, you see here in this, uh, in this uh, slide, uh, the basic reproduction number or, or not estimation is uh, uh, looked at by using different, all these five methods. The five myths are in the five columns shown here. And then on the left side, we actually see the actual, on the very left column, there is the actual or not or R zero. And uh, you look that the time, def the, the, actually the time dependent method, the one in the middle, it, it uh, is the closest to all of, uh, in most of the instances, it, it shows the closest uh, or not the actual uh, or not or, or zero uh, value. So at the time dependent, can you go to the next slide? Here in this slide, the root mean square error, uh, uh, which shows actually the bias values for, uh, for uh, R naught or R zero uh, as shown here. Uh, again, you can, you can see that, uh, unfortunately I cannot show it uh, with my pointer here, but if you look at the uh, middle column, the TD or the time dependent uh, reproduction number, this method basically after looking at in the statistical um, software, uh, it shows that this has uh, uh, the lowest bias uh, showing uh, in the, among uh, the other methods. Um, uh, go to the next slide, please. So um, we just want to uh, conclude with, I mean, we, uh, unfortunately there is not enough time to go into all these details, but uh, Basically, in this study, um, the researchers found that the, the time-dependent uh, reproduction number uh, calculation method or approach uh, was the most suitable approach for uh, computing the R0 or R0 based on the real cumulative uh, COVID-19 cases uh, in Iran, actually. So the time-dependent uh, approach or method uh, uh, has its own advantages in this case. Uh, because it, it comes with uh, the least amount of bias when they looked at uh, uh, the uh, lowest root mean square error you saw in the previous uh, uh, tables. Uh, it shows the least bias. It also has the ability to uh, satisfactory correct for uh, offspring cases, the cases that uh, go uh, 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 secondary uh, due to importation of cases during the course of an outbreak, for example. And it has another advantage that there are no requirements for extensive and 
very detailed data, even with, with data uh, 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 just uh, uh, collected over a, a limited period of time, it was still possible to come with, with the closest or not, or reproduction number, uh, with the closest number to the actual uh, ones. So this time dependent- uh, I'm sorry, you have to yes. end your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, that's Thank you very much, Dr. Amiri, and uh, we can, we will probably have time later for you to be able to uh, uh, explain a little bit more at the end of the sessions. Let's see. Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you very much, sir. And let's now go to the next presentation from Dr. Ala Hossein, an FETP resident from Iraq, to give to us the pattern of comorbidities among COVID-19 patients and their impact on the outcome in the Babel Governorate in Iraq, 2020. Go ahead, Dr. Hussein. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. My name uh, Dr. Ala Hussein, FETB resident, Baghdad University, Iraq. My study is pattern, a pattern of comorbidities among COVID-19 patients and their impact on outcome in Babel Governorate, Iraq 2020. Introduction. The COVID-19 patients with comorbidities have more severe course and higher risk of death. The presence of comorbidity poses a major clinical challenge in care and treatment of COVID-19 patients. Babel Governorate includes more than 2 million inhabitants, five healthcare districts, and 15 public health hospitals. The index cases was reported on 29 February 2020. In 2020, there were 20,645 cases of COVID-19 and 529 deaths. Objectives, to estimate the prevalence of comorbidities and identify the impact of these comorbidities on severity, length of stay in hospital and outcome among COVID-19 patients in Babel Governorate. Methodology, study type, descriptive cross-sectional study, study setting, the data was collected from patients record in two teaching hospital, with 289 admitted during March through September 2020. Study subjects, all laboratory confirmed cases, I mean positive PCR. Data, collecting, data collection tool, the data collected from patients record using the data collecting form on COBO toolbox, the collected data included. First, demographic characteristics. Second, the clinical presentation of comorbidity. Is there the severity classification as mild, moderate, severe, critical? Critical, I mean, need RCU, severe pneumonia and need oxygen, moderate pneumonia, but no need oxygen, and upper, and by, I mean, upper tract infection. For hospitalization duration. Discharge on our responsibility or refer to other hospital. Data analysis, the Microsoft Excel software 2010 and SPSS version 23 used in data entry and statistical analysis. Case square test used for assessing difference for categorical data. P value less than 0.05 considered statistically significant. Ethical approval, Iraqi Ministry of Health and Hospital Administration approval to access the data. Result, socio-demographic distribution of COVID-19 cases. Total cases about 2,574 cases. Most of them, more than 61% is male. About age group, uh, about 71% of cases occur in age group more than 40 years while only 29% occur in age group less than 40 years. 
distribution of patient by clinical manifestation, only 4% of patient asymptomatic, most common symptom fever, about more than 75%, followed by cough and shortness of breath. Less common one is hemoptysis, about 0.4. Distribution of patient by time and the number of comorbidities, about 60% of patients have no comorbidities, and about 40% uh, of, uh, of uh, cases come with comorbidities. About half of them, half of them, have more than one comorbidities. Most common comorbidities is diabetes mellitus, about 25%, followed by hypertension, 23%. Distribution of patient by severity outcome and hospitalization. Duration about severity, more than 66% of cases, severe critical cases, while 34% of cases is mild to moderate cases. About outcome, the case fatality rate, about 17%. About days of stay in hospital, more than 68 patients stay in hospital between 3 and 13 days. The mean Days of stay in hospital about one week, plus minus five days. Distribution of cases with comorbidities according to severity classification. About more than 66% severe critical cases and 34% mild moderate cases. Patient with comorbid illness, about 84% of patient with comorbid illness severe critical cases while 54% for patients without comorbidity. And it's statistically significant in all of them. For distribution of cases with the comorbidity according to the stay, uh, days of stay in hospital, about 10% of patients stay in hospital more than two weeks, while more than 20% stay less than 14 days. A patient stay more than two weeks, about 12% in patients with comorbid illness, while 8% for patients with no comorbidity. Distribution of cases with comorbidities according to the outcome, about 17% of, about 17% of cases, uh, uh, death rate, most, uh, with the patient with comorbidity, about 26.4, the death rate, while in patient with no comorbidity, the death rate about 10.6. And it is statistical significant in all of diseases. The last one, distribution of COVID-19 cases according to the outcome and number of comorbidities, the patient with comorbidity Comorbidity, the death rate about 10.6, while patient with only one comorbidity, the death rate about 24.3, and about 29 in patient with more than one comorbidity. Conclusion and recommendation. Comorbid illness like hypertension, heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, diabetes mellitus, malignancy, renal disease, asthma are associated with increased risk of severity and fatal outcome. Individuals with comorbid illness should undertake strict preventive measures and to take the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alahosin, for keeping on time. Um, and so may we call on the next presenter, uh, Dr. Youssef Sawani, public health professional from Jordan, to present to us his study on between herd immunity and suppression, a modeling study assessing alternative policy responses to COVID-19 in Jordan. Go ahead, Dr. Sawane. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria. I hope can, everyone can see my, uh, the slides I'm sharing. Yes, please. Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
so this is the research between herd immunity and suppression, a modeling study assessing alternative policy response responses to COVID-19 in Jordan. It was conducted by myself, Yusuf Zawani, and my colleague, Dr. Anas al muhtasib Both of us are physicians with uh, degrees in health economics. This study was also received uh, a grant from EMR, SDG, and American University in Cairo. So starting off with some, just giving some a quick background on the study, uh, when the WHO announced uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic early in, in early March, the Jordanian government responded by adopting uh, an extreme suppression strategy. Wide closures and very long curfews were implemented that involved closing of the airport, closure of schools, mosques, uh, shops, everything and uh, and by curfew people were not allowed to go out of their houses for around two or three months if 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 if, if i uh, if my recollection is correct now now the, ra the rationale behind the strategy was that the jordanian health system cannot absorb that was the estimation at the time that they cannot uh, absorb more than 200 daily cases of covid 19 and that an uncontrolled outbreak might cause the death of 200,000 Jordanian citizens. This was based on unpublished governmental reports. With that in mind, we aimed to provide policymakers with quantitative and qualitative evidence that builds on that experience and provides insights on what other alternative strategies could have been implemented and can be implemented in the future. I only need to, to highlight here that this research was conducted back in uh, September. Actually, it was conducted around June and July 2020. So the data we used in our model came from that period of time, which is quite different from what we have right now. The objective of the research was to estimate the burden of COVID-19 outbreak in terms of mortality and to conduct a cost-effectiveness analysis to compare alternative health strategies based on both direct costs, productivity loss, and cost-effectiveness. The methodology we adopted it was a cost-effectiveness analysis using a Markov model comprised of four health states, which you can see on, on, on the right of the slide here. The perspective we adopted, we actually adopted two different perspectives for the, for the calculation of costs, and that is a societal perspective, which was, which was based on the productivity loss, a calculation that was estimated based on the, the gross domestic product, uh, product annually, the GDP. And we also did the model, we ran the model based on a health provider perspective, where only the direct costs were included. The model horizon was six months. The interventions we compared were extreme suppression, which was implemented uh, in Jordan at the time, mitigation with institutional quarantine, basically a less, uh, a, a, a less extreme policy that, that was built on institutional quarantine and banning of uh, large public gatherings like weddings, uh, funerals, etc., and mitigation strategy without institutional quarantine, which is exactly the same as the one on top. However, it, was, it, it didn't involve the cost of an, an institutional quarantine. The key outcomes were incremental cost effectiveness, ICER, per life years saved using direct costs, and then ICER per life years saved using productivity loss. From the figure you see on the right-hand side of the slide, this is the model we implemented. Basically, patients moved from state A to B to three, and finally to death. Each health state, the movement from each health state was governed by a probability, which was obtained from the literature at the time. And each health state is associated with, an, with costs as well as clinical benefits measured in, in terms of life years. The life years calculation was made by subtracting the average age of death in each age group bracket minus the life expectancy in Jordan, which was 75. Clearly, this kind of values gives a higher value for younger patients. Um, 
moving on to the results in this slide i'm i'm, I'm excuse me if i'm uh, if it's a little bit too packed but really we are aiming here to uh, highlight only the key results and with with a, with quite a limited amount of time so in the bar chart you see in the on the left hand side of the slide this represents the incremental costs for each uh, for each strategy implemented the red bars reflect the uh, societal costs, as I said, which was based on uh, productivity loss on the GDP, while the small blue bars reflect the direct costs, which included uh, admission to the hospitals, uh, stay in the hospital, stay in the ICU, as well as the institutional uh, quarantine. The extreme suppression, which was implemented in Jordan, according to our model, was associated with the highest cost, both in terms of societal as well as direct cost. It, within six months, it accrued 3.6 billion Jordanian dinars, which is far, far more than any other strategy. As you can see, the rest were around half a billion, 400 million. As for the direct costs, again, the extreme suppression was associated with around 96 million while the mild mitigation strategy without quarantine was the co was a cost saving strategy with minus 5.4 the reason for the 96 million is mostly those costs were mostly driven by uh, the admission of every covid patient at the time the, the 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 strategy in jordan was they used to admit every covid patient regardless of how symptomatic and the, and regardless of the severity of the disease. And this is what drove the cost to be the highest here. Now, this is for the incremental costs. If we move on to the table we're presenting here, here we're presenting the incremental life years saved. And as you can see, the extreme suppression strategy was associated with the highest life years saved while mitigation with no quarantine had the lowest life years saved, which was 5,365. However, if we looked at the ice, the incremental cost per productivity loss, we, we can see that mitigation with quarantine was considered to be the most cost-effective strategy, with 41,000 per life year saved. As for the extreme suppression strategy, it was 2 million per life year saved. To put this into context, in a, in a country like uh, UK, well, it's, it's, it's actually hard to, uh, to assess that, but uh, because they don't, they use quality uh, qualities, per, uh, ICER per qualities instead of life year saved. But just to put it into context, it, it's 30,000. While in Jordan, the policy implemented had an ICER of 2 million. If we look at the ICER in terms of the direct costs, here the mitigation with no quarantine would be the most cost effective. As I said earlier, it is a cost saving strategy and it saves 979 JDs per life year saved. The figures below, below this table shows the cost effectiveness frontier. The lines you see reflect the ICER. The, the steeper it is, the higher ICER you get. To test the robustness of uh, our model, we conducted a sensitivity analysis, a one-way and two-way deterministic sensitivity analysis. We varied the ranges from 80 to 120% of the basic value. And for the costs, we, are, the range, we, 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 we made the range up to 500%. Almost in all cases, our results always stayed the same. The model was only sensitive to two parameters, which were the estimation of productivity loss. By the way, the estimation of the productivity loss was uh, obtained from expert opinions from a panel of uh, economists. So it was, uh, it was well accepted that we, we, we expected it already to be the, yeah, uh, the most sensitive, uh, uh, variable within our model. Nevertheless, even with that, 
the model showed even when we varied uh, the estimation of productivity loss, the results would tilt even higher into either without quarantine or no intervention at all. I'm now, sorry, just to Dr. Sawadi, yep, your your time is up. Oh, sorry, well, I'm 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 done. It's it's only the conclusion. It's uh... which is the most important. But I will probably have you uh, sure, uh, sure. more no time problem. during the question and answer. Thank you very much. Your pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, so we go now to the last presenter of this uh, session. Let us please welcome. Let us please welcome Dr. Mustafa al Sokul from Kuwait to present to us using a stochastic continuous time Markov chain model to examine alternative timing and duration of the COVID-19 lockdown in Kuwait. What can be done now? Go ahead, Dr. Mustafa. Okay, um, a good evening uh, and uh, good morning for, uh, for uh, I mean, depending on the where you are, and uh, thank you, Dr. Maria, for uh, introducing me. And um, um, can I share my slides, or somebody else has shared them? I am not sure. We can see your slides. Okay. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Can you hold on? Just uh, sorry. So may we ask the host IT to please help with the slide presentation? Sorry. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I, I had interruption in my internet. I had to switch it on. Somehow it, it uh, switched off. So can anybody hear me now? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes. So, um, so this... Um, um, I mean, we're trying to uh, model the timing, the optimal timing uh, and duration for the uh, COVID-19 lockdown in Kuwait. Um, next, please. Okay, so um, so I I'm not sure who's uh, holding the slide can, uh, I mean, yes. Yeah, so this was, um, this study was supported by the grant from the Kuwait uh, Foundation for uh, the Advancement of Science. Next, please. And so this would be the outline for the lecture. We'll uh, talk about the background, uh, about the COVID-19 outbreak in Kuwait and the initial events, and also the control measures that were implemented in Kuwait at the beginning. And we'll, um, I'll talk about the purpose of the study, the SEER um, uh, stochastic model, and our model, the expanded form of this uh, um, model, and also the results and the conclusion. Next, please. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, the um, a background about um, the, the timeline of the outbreak in Kuwait. Um, it was the first few cases were reported in Feb on February 24, 2020, and they were tra tra traced back to um, travel-related cases from the um, from Iran. Next, please. And after just the three weeks, uh, the confirmed number of cases increased to about 112 cases. And uh, after six weeks, the total cases uh, jumped up to uh, 556. And this, in, in, uh, I mean, indicated the um, um, is, uh, like uh, exponentially growth at the initial phase of the disease uh, or the outbreak. And Kuwait, like other countries, dealt with the repatriation, bringing uh, more than 50,000 uh, Kuwaiti citizens uh, from around the world back by May 7, 2020. Next, please. Um, when the first uh, few weeks of the outbreak, the government officials implemented uh, several non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, to reduce the person-to-person -person transmission. Next, please. And in the initial stages um, of the domestic outbreak, they used uh, contract tracing and implemented home and institutional quarantine. Next, please. Um, these uh, con control measures included closure of several institutions like schools, universities, government offices, and non-essential businesses. 
in addition to home uh, institutional quarantine, full border lockdown, partial curfews and lockdown. Yes, so um, I'm probably everybody is now familiar with uh, the major, the what's called non-pharmaceutical interventions and their intended effects. So I'm not going to go into details of this, but the lockdown is um, most um, most extreme uh, measure that involves um, the community quarantine, where um, it involve I mean includes stay at home or shelter in place to limit the movement of or activities in a community, thereby reducing the risk of transmission. Next, please. So in this uh, graph, um, we plotted the uh, um, the timeline of the control measures implemented by Kuwait government and it, it, it's ethics on the um, on the social contacts, you know, the we obtained the data uh, on the um, percentage of reduction or increase in social mobility from Google from Google mobility and plotted them in time and then overlaid them over the uh, the uh, uh, timeline of the interventions by Kuwait. We can see here that um, the control measures by the Kuwaiti government actually reduced the uh, mobility in the, um, among people in workplace and, and other places, but increased them in the households because you know people are now more staying at home. Next, please. So the main purpose of this study is, I'm not going to go through, through the, the text all of it, but in initial, usually in initial states of any epidemic or outbreak, there are many uncertainties and unknowns. So the mathematical modeling, modeling in this case becomes very important in to inform decision making of lockdowns and to provide evidence base for rational pandemic management. Next, please. Um, and we use Kuwait as a case study to um, if, uh, determine the effects of different timings and lengths of hypothetical lockdown scenarios. And um, we use actually the uh, stochastic continuous time Markov chain model. We analyze the effect of lockdown, lockdown timing um, due to COVID-19 with the emphasis on the attack rates, incidence, and peak hospitalization. These are the outputs or the indicators that we, um, we look at from our model. And we did try different timings, um, um, the days between the epidemic peak and the duration or the, the duration of the lockdown. How long is the lockdown? So the same model is actually a compartmental model that divides population into different states of the disease. And these population move um, or progress in these states or between these states um, um, according to different rates, according, I mean, depending on the disease dynamics and the nature of the disease. And usually the model is run by differential equations. Next. So uh, our expanded model is actually the same as here, but it has more states, you know, looking at um, susceptibles, exposed that may, I mean, exposed population to COVID-19 that may go into the um, uh, asymptomatic, the letter A or mildly um, infected without symptoms and H is hospitalized and then quarantined and then recovered and then death. So these are different, like eight states. Next please, so I will see the legend. Yeah, so these are the, you know, these are uh, eight states, they detect um, or depict disease transmission dynamics and also capture the initial uh, disease um, transmission and also accommodates the uncertainties involved in the um, disease transmission process. Next, please. So the results show that, um, I mean, this heat map shows the effect of the varying times of the duration of the uh, lockdown and which is the link here on the x um, on the x axis uh, sorry the y axis and the um, y, uh, x axis is the um, the starting time before the peak of the epidemic we we can see here that um, i mean the uh, uh, the duration uh, implementing the lockdown 10 days before the epidemic and for about maybe uh, 80 days will have the maximum benefit of 10% reduction in the attack rate however if we measure it by the peak hospitalization, which is really an important indicator, we can see that implementing it 15 days before the epidemic um, uh, peak for about um, maybe 45 or 50 um, days will achieve the maximum uh, or, or the optimal benefit of reduction of about 47 to 50% in the hospitalization. Next, please. 
Now we explored the effects of, I mean, the effects of different timing of the uh, um, of the peak or, or the implementation of the um, of the lockdown for different durations. We would try to see whether there are other durations and timings that could result in more uh, or more reduction in the uh, in the incidence rate, uh, incidence rate, the infection uh, infection incidence, as seen here in this figure. And we can see that. Um, um, implementing the lockdown 10 days before the epidemic and for 45 days can achieve a maximum reduction of about 47% in the incidence rate and not only a reduction of this amount by 50%, but it's also dividing it into two peaks, which helps the hospitals to better manage, you know, the, the cases um, uh, that, you know, might over, otherwise overload the hospital. Or the, whole, the or the health system. Next, please. And with regards to one minute to wrap up, please. One minute to many? wrap up. How many? Okay. Okay. So this is also showing the same result that for if, uh, in the case of hospital case load, that forty five percent. Um, I mean, forty five days uh, duration of the epidemic before implementing it before ten days of the peak also achieves the maximum benefit of reduction of the hospital uh, caseload of about 45%. Next, please. So our results show the hypothetical lockdown timing is critical. And that is, um, you know, 10 days uh, before the, the peak of the epidemic that lasts for 45 days achieves the maximum benefit in terms of the incidence as also the hospital caseload of about 50%. Next, please. Yeah, so this is me, I mean, um, uh, with the uh, severe con economic and also psychosocial social consequences of the, um, of the prolonged um, uh, lockdowns, we have uh, the modeling that helps into determining the optimal time, shorter duration of the lockdown that may reduce the, the, the um, you know, the chance of lockdown fatigue thereby, you know, reducing the impact, the economic impact. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. I'm afraid I, uh, your time is up. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, it is unfortunate that we don't have more time because really the five papers are so uh, very important and very interesting. Uh, we actually have time for only two questions. And uh, one of the more interesting questions is directed to Dr. Sawani. Uh, first of all, um, very, very shortly, please just give us the conclusion of your study. And given that there was a big uh, surge of cases in Jordan the last month, I believe, uh, would you think you will still derive the same conclusion given the big number of cases that you have last month? Yeah. Dr. Sawani? Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, well, given that, like you said, we, we, we've, we've had it back, we've developed it back in, in, in June and July, one of the biggest changes since then in the data is actually the mortality data. So we have used actually a very high mortality uh, ratio and mortality uh, probability, which led to our ISIS. If we 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 didn't we haven't run the uh, model with updated data, but we expect if we run it using today's mortality data, we will have even higher ISAs for each uh, strategy simply because the, the the mortality is less, while the costs are more or less the same. And our biggest conclusion from the study was, was the following: first of all, the currently applied curfews and lockdowns have an incredibly catastrophic and high cost. Regardless of how many lives they save, they are, they, they are extremely expensive strategies. That being said, we need to take into consideration the costs of these strategies when we design uh, our, our health policies. Cost effectiveness, and other modeling uh, analysis needs to be taken into consideration when designing health policies at the level of the state, especially that we are still using them up until today. 
I might add that the, 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 poli the expensive policies of lockdowns and curfews needs to be justified against the potential benefit. So this is really our, our number one conclusion from, from, from the study. Otherwise, we, 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 we will end up using very expensive treatment and very expensive health policies without uh, getting much gain for, for, for it. All right, that's very important to note the disparity between the lockdown and the gains. Okay, the second question is actually for Dr. Amiri. Um, Amiri, Dr. You, you discussed um, uh, five uh, methods for r not, if you may, uh, but then which of them would, uh, if any, would you actually find most suitable and is there a software or, or, or uh, something online that we can use to calculate the R naught? Uh, you are on mute, Dr. Amiri. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, uh, among the five methods, as, as the, um, the results showed, the time dependent um, R0 or R0 uh, uh, calculation method was the most uh, reliable. It was also um, the one which had the least bias uh, uh, attached to it. So uh, um, other methods would just go overestimate it or underestimate it with some confidence uh, level of uh, like with a range of, of values of the point estimate. But overall, the time dependent method was uh, shown in this study and, and this is uh, uh, we, we need to also consider that this, this was done in, in Iran so um, uh, I mean for uh, uh, for a population where we had already the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit very hard so uh, I think the uh, the time dependent that's one thing and yes there are some uh, actually this software um, I, I do not directly know as of now this moment I do not know of an online platform for calculating R, but there are some methods um, for, for doing that. And also the software package, as, as uh, it was explained during the presentation, the, uh, the R package actually itself, the R is a very robust statistical software. And over R, you will uh, have to uh, put additional uh, packages, uh, software packages, one of which is R0. So that software itself, the platform is called R, but it's a totally different uh, software, R uh, software. And then over okay. that, to yes. install R soft, R0 software package and, and that can do the calculations. Uh, I mean, so, it, it, uh, thank you. And, and it, I don't want to stop, but I have to stop. So thank you very much to all our presenters. And let me give you a clap in behalf of all our participants. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Maria. And of course, thank you, our dear presenters. Um, that was um, a highly interesting and uh, informative session. Um, let's move on to the symposium's uh, fourth and final session titled Within the Communities and Health Systems. Uh, this session's moderator is Dr. Carl Reddy. Uh, Dr. Carl is the director of TEFINET, the training programs in epidemiology and public health uh, interventions network. Uh, since March 2013, uh, Dr. Reddy has served uh, as the director of the South African Field uh, Epidemiology Training Program housed within the National Institute of Community Diseases of South Africa. Uh, and in June 2016, he was elected by the leadership of TEFINET's member programs for a three-year term as a chairman of the TEFINET Advisory Board. Um, so Dr. Carr, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Meral. Uh, I'd like to say good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It really is a pleasure to be here today. I think I see this as a privilege and uh, really wishing you all the best. I'd just like to say before the presenters start, please remember that you have 10 minutes to present uh, and there is a question and answer session at the end of the session. Uh, what I will do is I will give you a nine minute, at nine minutes, I will remind you, you have 
you have one minute left and then we'll stop the presentation at 10 minutes. I'd also like you to share your screen presenters. If you are having a problem with sharing your screen, please let us know and we can have IT intervene. Also, I'd like to request that everybody in the meeting mute their microphones, except for the presenter, of course. And if there's anybody who wants to ask a question, please remember to put your question into the Q&A box and not the chat box. Okay, and when you put in your question to the Q&A box, please list your name and your affiliation and the program that you fund from. So, okay, without further ado, I'd really like to welcome Dr. Hisham El Muadib from the Moroccan FETP. And Dr. Hisham El Muadib is presenting on the continuity of primary care for patients with chronic diseases during the lockdown due to COVID-19, uh, the perspective from healthcare professionals. And as we know, this is an area of great importance and that has been impacted severely by COVID-19 in many countries. So uh, Dr. El Muadib, you may share your screen and you may begin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carl. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, not yet. And now? Uh, not yet. Uh, would you like IT to share your slides for you? Okay, if it is possible. Okay, please IT, may you share Dr. El Muadib's slides? Great, and if we can just have it in the slideshow, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Muadib, okay. go ahead. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, pleased to uh, to thank the organizers of this symposium. I'm pleased to present uh, our study entitled Continuity of Care uh, for Patients with Chronic Disease During the Lockdown Due to COVID-19. This is the professional's perspective. Uh, on this occasion, I, uh, I will thank uh, our research team, including Professor Subbani, Professor Adarmoush, Dr. Mansouri, and finally the president of our research laboratory, Professor Amin. Um, next slide, uh, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, here is, um, as you know, okay, as you know, um, uh, the continuity of care presents uh, several, several advantages. It determines a patient satisfaction, it participates in early diagnosis, uh, and it uh, contributes to patient adherence to treatment, and it reduces the, um, the, the conception of uh, resources. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. As, as we had experienced in many countries, the circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, considerably disrupted the continuity of care for the patient with uh, chronic conditions, uh, in particular for patients uh, with chronic conditions in, in uh, public sector. Next slide. Um, it is uh, for this uh, observation that uh, promoted to, to draw the, the next objective of our study to as to describe the continuity of care from the uh, professional perspective in primary care with uh, chronic disease at the market prefecture during the lockdown due to COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, thank you. To do this, next slide, please. To do this, uh, we um, have some uh, elements of the methodology that we adopted 
uh, we uh, adopted a mixed descriptive study with uh, quantitative and qualitative contents. The data collection was uh, made by self-administered online questionnaire and individual telephone interviews. We uh, made the uh, data analysis uh, for the uh, uh, quantitative content with uh, uh, SPSS version 19 and the content analysis with in vivo version 10. Uh, for the population and uh, simple, uh, we have uh, doctors and nurses in primary care uh, from the public and private sector. Uh, we have uh, for the quantitative component uh, 107 uh, subjects and for the qualitative component 10 participants. For the ethical aspect, we got the approval of uh, the ethics committee uh, from the uh, um, faculty of medicine of Marrakesh. We respect the confidentiality of uh, information, data anonymity, the right to withdraw for the participants and the free and informed consent. Next slide. Next slide, please. And now we we move to our results. Uh, and first of all, for the um, characteristics of the participants, uh, we can see for uh, from the this table that uh, six five. Uh, 0.4 percent are female, 62.6 uh, percent are doctors, and 37.4 uh, are uh, nurses. 61.7 uh, have worked in America more than 10 years. Next slide, please. Um, with this table, we um, uh, we uh, see that uh, the uh, chronic disease of patients uh, these represent globally and uh, respectively 98.1 percent and 96.3 percent for diabetes and hypertension. Uh, this represents 80 percent and 81.6 uh, um, respectively uh, for the public sector. In addition, for consultation reasons. We find that the supply of essential medicines with 78.5% uh, and uh, the measurement of physical or biological parameters with 64.5% and finally the request of therap therapeutic advice uh, with 44.9%. Um, uh, Next uh, slide, please. Next slide, please. Now with the um, dimensions of uh, continuity of care, as we see in this table, we had uh, six uh, dimensions. The first uh, one is giving care alternatives, second one giving advice, the third one showing interest to patients, uh, the fourth one is answering patient questions, uh, the fifth is preserving <coughs> patient confidentiality, and the sixth one is delivering help to patients. And we, as we see in this table, um, uh, the most affected among these uh, six dimensions by the successes of lockdown of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic during the, uh, mind the dimension of giving advice uh, to patients, especially in the uh, public sector where professionals claim to be able to share, to, to apply these uh, uh, dimensions sometimes rarely or never with uh, 88 Point six percent. Uh, um, uh, likewise, uh, likewise for the dimensions show interest. The professionals in the public sector claim to be able to apply it. Uh, sometimes, rarely or never, with uh, eighty-four point three percent. And finally, for the dimension delivering help, the professionals in the public sector claim to be able to apply it uh, with 90.1%. Uh, uh, All the results was uh, statistically significant. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
we move to uh, results of the uh, components of the study uh, as we see the professionals spoke in their uh, verbatims uh, of the effort made in both sectors the private and the public sector to stay in contact with the patients uh, despite the, the lockdown conditions uh, by whatsapp or iphone uh, on the other hand they mentioned the constraints of uh, uh, the encountered uh, in preserving the privacy of patients uh, or by uh, guaranteeing them a sufficient supply in essential medicines, uh, in particular uh, in the public sector. As we see here, uh, the, the last one, we, uh, as we, as a, a doctor in public sector said, uh, we tried out best to manage all these constraints in a, order to supply them to reduce their repetitive visits to the health center. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now for the discussion, we can say that the addition of dimensions of continuity of care um, uh, was altered by the limitation of access in uh, primary care settings by the optimal infrastructure of these uh, and the capacity of, the, of these settings, and the lack of ventilation, the reduced stocks of essential medicines, the lack of um, personal protective equipment and the, the workload, the lack of coordination uh, with hospitals. I guess that uh, that was the situation in many countries like Morocco. Next slide. One minute left, Dr. El Muadib. Okay, I will. I will conclude. I came to the conclusion um, uh, to. Can we can see that the health uh, system decision makers uh, should learn many uh, lessons from this uh, pandemic uh, by introducing the family medicine approach with the, a reorganization of primary care and by implementing uh, of telemedicine. Uh, also by investing in the uh, digitization of information system and by improving the equipment of the uh, healthcare, healthcare centers and their physical structure. Uh, by this slide, I am to my uh, the end of my presentation. I will thanks uh, thank the uh, organizers and uh, my research team. Thank you, um, Dr. Al Muadib. Thank you very much for a very clear presentation, and thank you for sticking to the time. So I'd like to remind participants to put their questions into the question and answer box. Uh, and sorry, that was your timer going off. All right, thank you. May I call upon the next okay, speaker, please? Okay, and the next speaker is Dr. Rawan Kafri, who is a public health professional from Palestine. So welcome, uh, Dr. Kafri, and I understand that you will be presenting your own slides. Please try to put it in slideshow mode, and uh, then you may begin as soon as you are ready. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, clearly, thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to be presenting my, uh, our study with you uh, today. Our study is on stigma against COVID-19 patients in Palestine, a cross-sectional study with my colleagues Salwa Khalid Hudar and, and Hadil. To give you some background, uh, COVID-19 has elevated fears among people due to the uncertainties regarding the virus novel and the spread of misinformation and fake new news despite the large amount of news spread from multiple credible outlets and agencies. Constant exposure to news, warnings, travel bans, and the lockdown have caused people to experience fear and anxiety. Previous outbreaks, such as severe acute respiratory syndrome and H1N1, increased the fear among people and patients infected with these diseases as they were stigmatized. Survivors from SARS, for example, expressed not only feeling of avoidance from family, friends, colleagues, and neighbors, but they also faced difficulties in accessing the healthcare services and jobs and were um, marginalized in their communities. A CDC and WHO has warned about stigmatization against people, communities, and regions with cases of COVID-19. And as, there is, as a response, um, WHO, UNICEF, and other agencies have developed a guide uh, that uh, a guide addressing the social stigma and its prevention associated with COVID-19. So the study objective, to our knowledge at the time of the study, most of the research studies mainly focused on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and few examined the so social stigma 
and its association with psychological effects of COVID-19 on patients and their families. Therefore, the study was carried out to examine stigma faced by patients and their families to inform policy. So to speak a little bit about the methodology, the study, a participational study, and the study participants were selected from a list provided by the Ministry of Health of patients who contracted COVID-19, were cured and discharged from isolation and quarantine centers, and also finished their home quarantine at that time. The data collection was carried out in July 2020 using telephone-assisted computer interviewing, and oral consent was obtained from all recovered patients. And for recovered patients who were below 16 years old, we interviewed their parents. So the study included 93 patients, 77 from the West Bank and 16 from Gaza. Uh, the stigma questions in the survey were developed based on the abbreviated Berger HIV stigma scale, uh, and three subscales were used in the analysis. So we used personalized stigma, which is the consequences of other people knowing they have, uh, they have had COVID-19, disclosure concerns regarding COVID-19, and public attitudes, which is what people think of COVID-19. So the response rate uh, was uh, almost half of the participants, 46.5%. 25% um, were females and 74% were males. Uh, and the type of locality, most of them were from the village uh, at 62%. Uh, 35% were from urban uh, places and 2% from camps. To begin with the findings, um, to be, first I'm going to talk about the stigma against recovered COVID-19 patients. So uh, most of it were um, um, reported pub uh, public attitude, which is um, people being uh, are afraid of the person who have had COVID and people are rejected from uh, other finding out that they have COVID, followed by personalized stigma at 46%, which is losing friends uh, because they have had COVID or stop communicating with some people to do, due to their reaction to their uh, infection. And last but not least, the disclosure, which is I'm very careful who I tell I had COVID-19, and I worry that people who I know had COVID-19 at 20%. And then one of, out of the three interviewed recovered COVID-19 patients, uh, COVID patients said that stigma continued or increased after their recovery. And also in our study, it showed that 73% uh, of the participants who reported psychosocial stress during quarantine reported official public announcements regarding the outbreak, outbreak as the main stressor. Followed by uh, oh, it's missing. the stigma, for, um, the stigma uh, affecting the family of the COVID-19 patients. So around half of the participants Participants' families faced avoidance from the community, and around the same percentage uh, of families faced uh, faced stigma due to the to their infection with COVID-19. Also, regarding families uh, receiving support, 68% uh, of the families did receive support from the community due to the infection of COVID-19. Regarding losing uh, the, um, the COVID-19 patients, reco recovered patients losing their job, 49% uh, reported losing their job to, due to COVID-19 infection. And 34% of the employed study participant, participants reported fear of losing their jobs due to their infection with COVID-19. Our findings suggest that stigma is prevalent among uh, recovered COVID-19 patients. And yeah, and public health and healthcare providers should prioritize efforts to combat stigma and prejudice aimed to uh, aimed at those who have had uh, were infected with COVID-19 and their families. And public health interventions should mitigate stigma while caring for individuals, families, and communities. Addressing stigma and discrimination targeted toward individuals affected by COVID-19 and groups at higher risk is a priority for public health and healthcare providers. We've provided some recommendations, uh, which is it is critical to um, it's critical to create a public mechanism to check the accuracy of information published by the media. Communities and mental health authorities should continue to collaborate, to strengthen social support structures, and alleviate stigma associated with diseases. 
also it's important to develop a um, tailored mental health care plan for the population, especially for the quarantined and medical personnel, and the use of language uh, that respects and empower COVID-19 patients. And those are do's and don'ts uh, provided by the uh, World Health Organization. For example, we, we, shouldn't, uh, we should call uh, people with COVID-19, people who had, have COVID-19, not COVID-19 cases, people who may have COVID-19, not suspected cases, and so on. Talk positively rather than negative and threatening uh, messages and all that. And our study limitation, the study sample was convenient and included a, num a limited number of study participants from Gaza due to the num a very small number of patients at that time. And there was a very low response rate, uh, rate was also a limiting factor at the study. Uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kafri, for a very clear presentation and, you know, clearly for presenting on a topic that is very relevant. I mean, you know, we have the issue of stigma associated with the outbreaks, pandemics. Uh, 25 years ago, HIV AIDS was a similar problem currently with COVID-19 and Ebola. And, and thank you for sticking to time. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, what proportion of patients were under 16 years of age? Do you know offhand? Yes. Can you give me one? Uh, under Certainly. Years. Yes, under 16. And then a reminder for participants to please put their questions into the Q&A box. Uh, do you mind providing you with the answer just after the next presentation? Certainly, that's not a problem at all. And then Dr. Kafri, did you look into the association between gender and stigma? At, no, we did all? not. We did not because uh, our sample size was very small, but... Sure, go on. Oh, yeah. So okay. we, we only use descriptive analysis for most of our uh, study. Okay. Okay. And then what did you, what do you actually mean by avoidance? Avoidance was at 51% and stigma was at 53%. So what is the difference between avoidance and stigma? Again, which slide was this one? Um, I'm reading this out of the chat. Uh, so I'm not sure, probably your results. Avoidance was at 51% and stigma at 53%. Okay, if you like, you can also, I guess, answer it in the general uh, question and answer session after this. Not a problem at all. Uh, and sorry, avoidance, yeah, now I know. Uh, avoidance is no one wants to come near them, meaning. Okay, okay, yeah. uh, okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Kafri, and we'll address some further questions in the right. Q&A session. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I would really now like to welcome uh, Dr. Awa Omer Musa from Sudan, and Dr. Omer Musa is presenting on the response to the COVID-19 pandemic in dental care settings in Khartoum State, Sudan, interventions, challenges, and the way forward. August 2020. Um, welcome, Dr. Omer Musa. You may begin. Thank you for introducing me. Um, I'll be presenting the topic as mentioned uh, with my, um, and thank you for my colleagues, who, uh, Dr. Maisa, Dr. Summer, Dr. Yusuf, and Dr. Muntasser. Um, so just to give you a, a brief background about this, so um, as we all know that uh, the pandemic has extreme challenges for both dental and for medical practices. And um, looking at the dental practice that has a really special nature due to the proximity of um, patients to dentists um, and even close proximity in, even to the, the source of the infection. And uh, so this actually affected the dental practice uh, widely and globally and uh, resulted in the, in the emergence of new um, uh, policies and strategies even. And looking at Sudan context in regards to health system, um, the country is going, as you know, in, through a traditional period. So we are facing some kind of political and economical instability 
and the health system is a bit fragile. And um, if we look at dental services, they are provided as part of the PHC packages, and uh, more than 60% of the package of the dental services are provided through private sector. I'm going to jump into the, my objective because I think now we're aware of what, what exactly the problem now. And uh, our objective from this study is, was exactly to, it was a qualitative uh, approach study. So we, we try to document the experience during the uh, COVID-19 and, and highlighting all the interventions because there have been a lot of interventions done by dental practitioners and even by the uh, State Ministry of Health um, uh, Oral Health uh, Directorate. And also to report all uh, these interventions and the challenges in, in encountered while implementing them, and also to report um, what were the, the lessons learned in order to inform those of power in, in, in formulating strategies so as to uh, provide um, uh, some kind of system interventions. Um, and when we go to the methodology, as I said, it's a qualitative um, uh, operational research work that use qualitative methodology as a framework, and we use the phenomenology approach um, and uh, all interventions that have been done in the dental care uh, setting has been Id identified and all the bottlenecks encountered during implementation. Uh, these interventions included those done by the dental care providers and those launched by the oral health directorate within the Khartoum State Ministry of Health. And uh, as I said, it's limited to Khartoum because at that time, and, and this, is, this study was done during wave one, uh, at that time Khartoum was the state that reported the highest number of cases. And um, we had all the agencies and organizations that contributed into uh, planning or facilitating the, the services delivered during COVID-19. And it was a purposeful sampling, as you can see. And um, our key informants were both from governor levels and uh, regulatory bodies and to providers, public service provider to dental uh, service providers, uh, private dental care service. So the data was collected through an uh, uh, interview guide, uh, that is semi-structured guide, and uh, the participants described their role um, during the response to COVID-19, uh, the, the, the intervention they were engaged in, challenges they encountered, and the lessons they learned. And also um, uh, there was a document review that was, has been carried out just, just as a mean to triangulate uh, what has been mentioned uh, through the interviews. When we go to the analysis, actually, we um, analyzed uh, all these uh, um, interventions and initiatives and the challenges following the semantic approach. So when we look at the results, the results actually is about interventions that has been done and the challenges encountered. So six mainly uh, interventions that has been mentioned, um, such as uh, provision of supplies uh, that support in infection control for hospitals and the closure of private uh, clinics and uh, establishment of a protocol for emergency hospital and how to facilitate um, uh, the delivery of emergency dental services. Also um, a very nice intervention was the online consultation and finally reviewing and updating uh, the clinical protocols for reopening of the private sector. And uh, when we look at the provision of infection control uh, supplies, there has been many initiatives uh, led by the dental community uh, to, for, for uh, fundraising to avail the PPEs. This is estimated for a fund for about $27,000. And for sustaining uh, PPE supplies, there have been some uh, initiatives that supported the issue of local manufacturing of gowns and face shields. It has been a very nice initiative done by Be Safe by two uh, beautiful ladies, uh, dentists, who has uh, actually supported the local production of gowns. They produce about 24,000 surgical gowns and they even became suppliers for the isolation centers uh, in Sudan. And for the closure of the clinics, the, so private clinics were closed, but there have been six uh, public uh, hospitals who were providing the services and they were managed by specialists and some volunteers, junior volunteers. And mainly like four hospitals, um, you can see the names provided almost about 1,125 services to the patients. And there has been two hospitals that has been rehabilitated for this purpose. And uh, they served uh, also uh, about uh, almost um, 179 dental intervention and 300 consultations. And when we look at uh, the closure of the private clinic, there have been some people who were opposing this and some people who were supporting this. The supporters were about uh, argued that um, opening private clinics without good body to regulate um, them, this could actually cause uh, the spread of the disease. And other who were, uh, who were uh, who 
were upholding this actually claimed that this will affect on the accessibility of the dental services, looking at that private sector actually provide almost 60% of the services. When we look at the uh, protocols, the protocols uh, that has been developed uh, during COVID-19 focused on the issue of emergency, looking at areas of, um, and we find some cases as emergencies like uncontrolled bleeding, cellulitis trauma, and uh, the severe pain and dry sockets, and you and, and can see the list there. So um, they, they, they looked at three areas, mainly severe pain, trauma, and uncontrolled bleeding as main um, um, emergency situations. And then there was the online consultations, which has been uh, managed by almost um, uh, 30 consultants, um, six consultants per shift. The shift lasts for eight hours. They had um, uh, made options available for callers uh, about severe dental pain, swelling and abscesses, trauma and fractures, pediatric consultation and general adult consultation. Actually, there has been, they followed the three A's approach, which was advice and prescribing and analgesics and antibiotics. Um, there has been a total of 3,706 calls. Uh, most of them were actually inquiring about the nearest hospital, and also most of them were about uh, inquiring, uh, asking, having uh, dental pain as the main uh, uh, complaint. And then, when uh, for the review of the private uh, uh, of the uh, of the private or updating the clinical protocol for opening uh, private sector, four areas has been um, uh, mentioned in this protocol, like how to how to actually protect the staff, how to manage the waiting areas, how to do triaging, how to do patient screening, and uh, and so on. Then when we go to the challenges, the challenges has been uh, divided according to the uh, health system uh, uh, building blocks, service delivery challenges, so finance, human resources, and governance challenges. In regards to the service delivery challenges, the main challenge you can see that accessibility, Khartoum is very big. You have, having only six hospitals providing the services, along with the curfew that has been at that time, definitely affected the issue of accessibility of patients to uh, the hospitals. And also there has been financial logistic challenges, for example, the PPE shortages, which has been worldwide, but actually at, at, at that time, the prioritization was for isolation centers and not for dental care providers. Financial challenges supported by private sector as they were not capable of providing salaries to their staff um, because of the uh, the issue of the closure of private clinics. And when you look at the human resource challenges, the issue of most some dentists were absent, they would not care they were afraid of providing services, and there has been high workload on those who were working. And there was also the issue of the culture of how uh, supporting staff in the dental clinic should deal with uh, pandemics. The governance challenge is the issue of how to enforce these guidelines and these policies that has been done uh, in order to be adhered and in order to be monitored and that you ensure that everyone is actually uh, 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 abiding to these uh, protocols. Just to finalize this, I think the final lesson learned that we have learned that um, yes, we know we all know that dental care is quite uh, unique in regards to this structure, in regards to its logistical uh, requirements, but we need to consider this clearly and seriously when we start designing interventions in order, especially in, in, in emergency, so that we increase the resiliency of uh, the dental care uh, during emergencies. Also, um, the issue of providing telemedicine. I think this uh, pandemic was really great in providing the chance that telemedicine could be um, an alternative in remote areas. And, uh, and, and how- Five seconds left. Okay, Sorry. final. Okay, just to finalize this is the issue of also in, uh, investing in human resources uh, in the issue of public health emergencies and how to maximize the role of the private sector and institutionalize it within the with, with the private with the public sector and providing public private uh, uh, partnerships. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Omer Musa, for a very interesting presentation on a topic that maybe a lot of us ignored or did not uh, you know, uh, realize is so important, but thank you for drawing our attention to that. Thank you. Thank so you. thank you very much. I'd like to have all three presenters for the session be prepared to answer questions. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Al Muadib. And um, the first question for Dr. Al Muadib is, uh, which type of care should be continuous? So in terms of your presentation, which type of care should be in continuity uh, or should be continuous? For, for the type of, uh, of care, um, in our study, we, um, 
we uh, talk about uh, the primary care, the primary care in the uh, healthcare centers in Morocco. Uh, I guess that uh, that is uh, available in uh, the other countries. Okay, so Dr. El Moadib, so, you are uh, referring talk about the primary care. Yes, yes, go on, go on. Uh, with primary health care, you're talking about the basket of services, so the complete basket of services of primary health care uh, as recognized it's, by the World uh, Health Organization. It's basically the, the preventive uh, care for patients where, uh, with uh, chronic disease. You know, it's uh, to uh, by getting advice, by um, by supplying in uh, essential medicines, uh, and so on. Okay, thank you for that. The next question for you from the chat is: uh, Having only ten participants in the qualitative study is rather small. May I ask? Well, uh, for the qu qu qualitative component, as you know. Uh, um, the the simple size is function of the data saturation of uh, the, the, the 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 data saturation principle. Uh, we cannot we cannot determine the uh, simple size previously. Uh, so we we uh, we got it uh, um, uh, uh, with the uh, recruitment of the uh, participants, so uh, it's not with the uh, ten participants. We can we cannot say that it is uh, a small size for the uh, qualitative components. But for okay. for the uh, quantitative component, we had uh, one hundred and seven uh, participants. Okay. Did you do any content analysis or latent content analysis? As 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 uh, as I said in the uh, lecture, uh, we we do the content analysis with uh, in vivo. Uh, this is um, a, a known uh, software uh, that we use in in this uh, in this um, uh, occasion of uh, content analysis. Uh, I guess that the uh, researchers that uh, that we that the that they do uh, the the qualitative uh, analysis uh, know uh, know this uh, software. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Al Muadib. Uh, a thank question you. for Dr. Kafri. Sure, Dr. Kafri. Uh, any uh, update on the proportion of patients that were under sixteen years of age that were admitted to hospital? Uh, we can't hear you, uh, Dr. Kafri. Um, okay, um, maybe if you try to unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Kafri is still muted. Okay, let's look at another question here. So, um, Dr. Uh, Musa, Dr. Omer Musa, please could you update us on the dental response in the second wave? So I guess, how was the second wave different from the first wave in terms of the dental response? Okay, so for the second wave, I think, um, unfortunately, is that, uh, um, or not unfortunately, but we, we had um, a protocol for opening the private clinic has been um, issued and uh, all private clinics were, um, uh, were required to follow this protocol in order to have their practice running. So this has been issued uh, to be on, on uh, ongoing. But um, we come to the challenge that everyone was discussing that who is following up on whether these private clinics are really uh, following this protocol or not, because um, Khartoum is a very big city and we have uh, thousands of, of private clinics uh, within um, the city. And uh, you need a closed monitoring system to make sure that everyone is abiding by the protocol and following um, what being uh, mentioned on it. Uh, for the public uh, sector, um, uh, they try to limit as much as possible of, uh, of the interventions to um, to emergency ones, but they also had their strict protocols regarding uh, especially what type of PPEs to be uh, followed um, in aerosol generating procedures um, when we use these drills and so on and 
versus non aerosol generating procedures when we don't use drills. So yes, yeah, so they had these protocols issued uh, and how to what to wear and what to do um, in each case. Yeah. Okay, um, Dr. Omer Musa, may I just confirm you are a practicing dentist? You are working in the dental services. So I'm a, I'm a dental graduate. I hold a bachelor degree in dentistry, but I'm a specialist in international health. And uh, currently I'm a registrar in, uh, um, in the MD of dental public health, uh, but I'm not working clinically. I'm basically in public health. Okay, thank you, because there's a comment in the Q&A box, and the comment is, uh, I think that prevention and control of COVID-19 is a part of infection prevention and control of all services that are given to patients. So the question is, why did you focus on dental care? I mean, clearly, uh, dental care, dental, uh, your first degree was in dentistry, and secondly, you're working in public health, and you obviously have expertise in the dental uh, area of public health. So I guess that is why you focused on that particular area. And yes, I agree for the comment that prevention and control of COVID-19 is important of, in infection prevention and control of all services that are given to patients. So yes, thank you for that comment. Um, so and I'd like to just give Dr. Ravan Kafri the last chance if she's still available. Uh, we still have a minute or two left. Uh, so Dr. Kafri, if you're still available, please unmute. Uh, if not, I'd like to say thank you very much. I think this was a really interesting session. It was an eye opener. Thank you to the presenters, very clear presentations and congratulations to all of you. I'd like to hand over to Meral, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carl. And uh, I would also like to thank our presenters and uh, participants. I think we are all happy to see this high level of engagement in the discussion. Um, and now, dear participants and presenters, we have reached the end of our event, the closing ceremony. Uh, so please allow me to present Dr. Yusuf Khadr. He is the director of the Center of Excellence for Applied Epidemiology at Infinite and also the head of the Symposium Scientific Committee. Dr. Yusuf is a, is a distinguished professor of epidemiology and biostatistics. biostatistics. Um, so now I will hand the floor over to Dr. Youssef to present the tribute movie and Professor Al-Fatih Samani Best Abstract Award. Uh, so uh, Dr. Youssef, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miral. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, after two days of effective knowledge sharing and after listening to many interesting presentations covering different aspects of COVID-19 research in the region, it is my pleasure to announce the winners of the Best Abstract Award. This year, we feel that it is fitting to give this award in honor of one of the distinguished public health experts in the region. In honor of Professor Al-Fatih Samani, God rest his soul in peace, we introduce Al-Fatih Samani Best Abstract Award. Professor Samani was known for his humility, willingness to help and support, and his commitment to supporting those around him. He had the genuine interest in people's health and safety, as he played a significant role in advancing public health career and the practices in Sudan, as well as the entire region. In honor of his memory, we share this short video that highlights some of his many notable achievements and contributions to public health.
Now, I'd like to announce the name of winners. I'd like to share my screen, if you don't mind, please. Actually, we have two winners who scored the highest and the same score. So both got the first winner. So the first winner is Dr. Shirin El Ghazali and her colleagues for their abstracts and the study entitled The Impact of Comorbidities on COVID-19 Severity and Mortality in Egypt. Dr. Shirin El Ghazali, she's a FETB graduate and also she is epidemiologist uh, and surveillance department at Egypt Ministry of Health. Congratulations, Dr. Shirin. The, the other winner is Dr. Yusuf Zawane and his colleague for his or their abstract entitled between herd immunity and suppression, a modeling study assessing alternative policy responses to COVID-19 in Jordan. Dr. Yusuf is currently works in London, UK, and he is a physician by training, and he holds an MS degree in health policy from London School of Economics and Policy. And also he has another master degree in health economics from Cardiff University. Big congratulations to you all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Youssef, and congratulations to the winners. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to Dr. Mohanad al nusur for the symposium's closing remarks. Um, the floor is yours, Dr. Mohanad. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, I congratulate the best winner, uh, the, the best uh, abstracts for all presentations. Uh, Dr. Mohanad. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, once again, I, I would like to congratulate our winners for uh, this symposium. And uh, I want to thank you all for being with us over a period of the two days where we had two keynote speakers and almost 20 presentation covering a range wide of topics related to COVID-19 and mainly operational research. And I, I believe that the presentation from different countries re reflected multiple challenges, findings, and other results and showed how research, operational research can be used to address these challenges and care in our region and the globe in general. As a pandemic, COVID-19 allowed the public health community, including the field epidemiology training programs, to utilize research skills in investigating and responding to this pandemic. Within this context, the symposium highlighted the important role of field epidemiology and the value of presenting field data in a scientific context. I thank you all for attending and I thank each and every presenter, keynote speaker, of course, my colleagues and uh, dear friends, moderators and FETB directors, resident advisors, resident graduates and mentors and other public health prof professionals in our region and beyond who contributed to our symposium success. And in closing, I hope that we can have more opportunities to come together on fruitful exchanges, maybe even face-to-face. -face. Thank you all.